Hello, everyone. I hope you have enjoyed your networking time. We are back here. I'm going to introduce you to Jais Hilenium. I, I think I'm not sure if I say it good, but he has been writing for the European Commission Open Source Observatory since he started in January 2007. And he has written some 2,000 new items cases for them, reporting to mostly European Union public services using of open source. Today, he's going to talk with us about critical success factors from open source implementation in public service. Welcome, Jax. Jax, come to the stage. You can come to the stage and turn in your camera on and your micro. Yes, it's, um, yes. I'm, I'm doing my best. I'm clicking on, on things. So it's Gijs, yes. and you did it right when we practiced it. So I know, sorry. I should say you would make a mistake later on. Thank you. Sorry, I will practice more. That's fine. All right. Thank, thank you. For you. And so, I let you the presentation. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So good afternoon um, to everybody who has joined us, um, and thank you, Gemma, for the uh, or as we would say in the Netherlands, Gemma, for that nice introduction. I also uh, would like to thank Andrea and Philippe who have been chasing me online to uh, get me to commit this talk. Um, I have prepared um, uh, a set of slides. It's not too much. I'm going to share my screen um, and then I have to click on a few things, click on the entire screen, allow. You will see the presentation and I was told you will also see me. I'm just checking, yes, you do. Okay, so I, st I stay in the, in the, in the view. Um, so before I dive in, you've just read the title, I have to get just these two things off my chest. Um, so first in the next half hour, I've timed it, it's 30 minutes, 31 minutes, I will present you my very own summary of the work that I've done for the European Commission's Open Source Observatory. And there is this first paragraph here that tells you that that's what I'm doing. It's not the Commission's view, it's not the European institution's view, it's my view. And second, the other thing um, for this talk, when I, um, I consider software, free software and open source software to be two ways to describe basically the same thing. I know there are subtle differences, but when I say free, I mean open. And when I say open, I also mean free. So with that, we can really start. And as this slide will show you, it should be a pretty straightforward talk. I will give you the success factors, AKA the beginning of a maturity model for making open source work in public services. There are basically things, there are basic things to look for uh, that will show you, that will tell you, it will show you how well supported your open source is in a particular public service. Uh, and along the way, I will point you to um, key government policies from mostly European Union countries and a few others. The goal here is to help you find examples. Perhaps you can share these ideas with public services, local, national, or other. I will have one slide um, to summarize the benefits of open source and public services. The, the, most of the people that are logging on to this session will already know what the benefits of open source are. And so this slide is not there for you. I'm what, I, what I try to do is to aggregate the motives for public services to go to open source so others can find them and repeat them and work on this to, uh, to build their own policies examples. And lastly, I will present you a list of what advocates of open source still need to do to increase the use, to increase the use of open source in public services. But before I do all this, I will talk a little bit about Ozor. So, um, I hope you can see the URL of the slides because it's on my site, which is mylastname.com. It's, it's easily findable. All of these blue URLs are clickable and will bring you to either the article or the case study or the report or, this or the whatever that I use to build the argument on. So this shows you how this works. It's all built and revealed, by the way. Um, and I was going to talk about the, the OSOR. The observatory gives you access to news, to case studies, reports on, you guessed it, open source and public services in the European Union and in a few other countries. So that's Turkey, Switzerland, Norway, Greenland, United Kingdom, and a bunch of others. And like Hema said, 
Um, I have so far contributed close to 2,000 or just over 2,000 news items uh, since January 2007, and I've helped uh, on a fair number of cases and studies that are available on the portal. You'll find in total some 100 case studies, many of which have a standard format because we try and capture the systemic change requirements for um, public services to, uh, to use and implement open source. OZOR is one part of the JoinUp eGovernment portal. Um, it seeks to provide links and access to the portal. Uh, this portal, JoinUp, provides links to some 4,000 government IT solutions um, that are available not only uh, as open source, but they are available for other public services to use. And if they're open source, they're available for everybody else, of course, as well. It includes many federated repositories linking the solutions from, for example, the Spanish central government to those, for example, from the French government or the Norwegian government and the Austrian government. OZOR is one of the parts, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, is one of the parts of the sharing and reuse action, which is <coughs> one of the many actions of the European Commission's ISA Square program. For OZOR, the ISA Square program is currently focusing a lot on sustainability of government open source projects. It's doing surveys, it's organizing a series of webinars too, in a nutshell, help public services figure out how to keep their open source project alive long-term. If you're interested in that, I recommend you sign up for these webinars. They're really cool. And um, they're helping us to build a series of documents and guidelines and experiences to help public services make sure that the governance of their open source projects helps them forward. One of the very other neat components of the sharing and reuse action is the biannual award contest. This gives real money to public services that promote sharing and reuse. And open source, as you can guess, is a really strong plus here. So OSOR is also the birthplace of the EUPL, um, the European Union's uh, free software license. It's a strong copyleft license. Um, it's explicitly compatible with many other free software licenses, including the GPL v3. This may be a bit boring, but it's important that I mention it. Um, there's just three things that you want to know about the EUPL. It has 23 languages which are legally identical. So you can work with somebody in Finland who can read the Finnish version, and you can work with a colleague in Greece who can read the, Greece version, the Greek version. The European Commission has made sure that it is tailored to European copyright. And most importantly, it is intended to allow downstream merging with other licenses. That's this whole that's why it comes with this list of compatible licenses, which makes it a very strong copyleft license. And the goal is to advocate reuse. It's a super useful license for specifically larger European public services projects, where it helps to encourage others to uh, join them and work together. But enough about the background. Let's get to work. Now that you know what the talk is based on, the work that I've done for the OZOR, what steps should public services actually take to do more with open source? In my opinion, it's four steps. There's no real order because they are all important. You need to do all of these. You can't have successful open source if you don't have a practical policy for open standards. And your government's open source projects won't be very successful if they don't know how to get involved with free software communities. Makes sense, right? So the first step is to make free and open source a task for the CEO, or in other words, to make sure you have top level support for your open source projects. And this is where a lot of arguments come in. This is about costs, flexibility, control. And as many public administrations will discover, the decrease in license costs that everybody always talks about, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Once public services get a really serious experience with open source, they discover how it lets them industrialize implementations and it reduces costs on all levels. They discover how open source gives them flexibility, scalability and speed. You can do a little experiment, a small pilot, and when it's really successful, it can be rolled out across the organization without having to go through complicated procurement procedures because the license allows you to do it as often as you want it. One reason it has become really important the past year, I would, say, I would say, the last year, the last two years, is technological sovereignty. At the Commission conference that we organized in November last, uh, last year, 
one of the officials uh, referred to it as a buzzword, which maybe it is, but it does show that one of the more complicated characteristics of open source is reaching political leadership. And you see this across Europe in the debates about, uh, for example, the tracking and trace uh, applications for our smartphones re related to the COVID-19 uh, epidemic, epidemic, excuse me. In many countries, almost in most countries, the governments have first came up with a plan to basically uh, hire a software company and do some kind of centralized step to track and trace the entire population. Of course, there was pushback and it was a good thing. And things have changed in the past 10 years so that the, argument, the arguments that advocates of openness came with are getting across. These messages are getting heard. And as a result, most of the track and trace apps in Europe are now open source. And most of them use the pan-European privacy preserving, preserving proximity tracing system. They wrote it exactly like that to tease me. Here, openness has won and so did open source. So um, on the next slide, you will see a few examples um, of support. Hang on a sec, I've lost my notes. Um, just two seconds. Click, 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 click. You'll see a few examples of support that encourage um, open source in, in various sizes of public administrations. Not all of these links I will show you that's how you will get to the uh, to the, the the articles or cases on Ozor. Not of them, not all of them are up to date, but they're but they're there to get you started, um, and they're there because they're important cases. So, uh, for example, the first two examples uh, are national governments demanding and enforcing the use of open standards. They use them as a reward criteria in procurement, and that is something I recommend that all public services try and do. The second line gives you examples of public services that encourage open source across regions. Uh, these span different layers of public services. It can be towns and villages, but also um, regional organizations that look at, for example, hydrology or environment uh, and other things. And there is this wrong example of Munich. That's because the previous mayor understood very well what was this about? What this whole switch to open source is about? And the arguments for Munich remain valid and they are really worth your time. And also because Munich proves that it is essential to have support from the top. In Munich, the city was not so much pushing for open source, it was trying to rationalize its IT organization. It has or it had over 20 different IT offices spread across the city and getting them all over to the same platform and rationalize IT, that was the real challenge. And there was, of course, lots of resistance in all these different kingdoms. Uh, and there had many different reasons to be uh, for, for resistance. But it was always nice to be able to go to the mayor and say, have him say, this is where we're going and this is how we're doing it. Similar example is the, um, the government of the Basque region. Uh, close to a decade ago, there was a CEO that understood open source really well and it, he knew how it promotes diversification and how it created the chance for local industry. And he knew how it made total sense for public services to use and create open source. So in the policy that he pushed into the bus country, which is a really nice one, he inserted these pay it forward argumentations um, that, that win from the usual sunk costs over proprietary software. The second step you must take if you want to be serious about open source in public services is you need to know what open standards are and you need to have a policy um, that defines it and you need to know and work towards open APIs. I said definitions. Well, you have to watch out for definitions, especially for the ones that you don't actually have much to say over. In addition, it's proving very difficult for public services to take care of a selection of open standards. Sweden has done a lot of research, research in this area, including on the definition, uh, on standard setting organizations, and on how governments should check and double check that these organizations are open and that their standards are up to snuff. So I recommend you look at those studies. And if you have, this is a request from me to you, if you have a practical policy of an open standards policy, sorry, if you have a practical idea of an open standards policy, you should let us know. 
But again, here are a few examples. The, um, um, again, the, the reason that I, I put these links is that people can read them and uh, study them in more detail. I will not go over them one by one. What is interesting here is to have, for example, uh, the city of Schoten here in Belgium, where uh, the head of IT, Jan van Linden, once said that public, public administrations that do not use open standards are working against the ones that do. And that's, that's definitely true, because um, document interoperability is the biggest problem still out there, and it has to do with a complicated uh, situation in document standards. The Dutch uh, government central portal um, it has a name, but it's maybe not worth uh, saying it here. Rijksoverheid.nl, there it was, is using the, Dr the Drupal CK editor to enforce the government's own open standards policy. And on that list, the Dutch list of open standards, the document standard that everybody, the document format that everybody uses is missing because the Dutch have said ODF is fine, but the other one is not fine. And this means that when the government is trying to upload documents into their, into their general uh, website, they have to convert from the, the format that they use to ODT. It's a really neat way to enforce open standards, but it's causing a bit of headaches for a lot of ministries in the Netherlands. In France, there's the, uh, the RGA, which um, includes currently OXML, the, the other document standard, um, saying that there is goodwill to use ODF, but it's, um, it's, not, it's not only, it's just not that practical. There's a lot of cases where governments are forced to use or prefer to use, uh, for example, spreadsheets with built-in things, um, and therefore they have to allow OXML in some of these cases. And since I have been speaking about uh, ODF and OXML, it is really the, the most problematic standards out there. Um, 12 years ago, uh, ISO for some reason accepted uh, OXML as a standard. Uh, we all know that no one really implements it and so we still have the problem today that one document cannot be read by the other uh, entirely, uh, entirely in its entirety. There's always little mistakes. But documents aside, interoperability problems are really becoming a thing of the past. And that is uh, thanks to um, standards and open APIs. With that, it's time for step three. You want to use, this is, so this is the one uh, slide that I forgot that was there. If you want to use open standard, these are the good ones, HTML5 and CSS3. Um, this, this presentation is built in them and it makes uh, a lot of sense to have that as one of the drivers. The, the real step three that I want to talk about is uh, you have to help the organization change. And it speaks for itself. You have to do small scale pilots and take baby steps. Switching to open source is often almost painless when it introduces cool new ways of doing things. When people see it as an upgrade and when it makes things, processes, not so much the computers, a lot faster. In other words, when it reduces red tape. And most of this will happen in the space of e-government services in case management system, in online interaction with citizens. And since most of the web is built with open source, most of these things never mention that this is open source. That open source is, in that sense, the hidden trend that nobody notices. We all talk about blockchain, about high performance computing, about quantum computers, about AI, but we all forget that this is mostly built on open source. In fact, any new software project out there will very soon see that about 80% of its code is basically open source, because you're not gonna write this all again if it's already out there and you're free to use it. Turning it into this practice, most villages and towns, they really love their content management system, but they don't know it's open source. And nearly all municipalities love to be able to get their citizens to use the web to report on broken street lamps or sidewalks with a pothole or that there was litter in this uh, in the bush somewhere. And then they don't know that they're using tools created by, for example, Madrid or Barcelona, that, they were, that they're made available as open source. But the big problem for organizations, for public services, occur when the switch is not an upgrade, it's not an improvement, 
but it's just a change. If public services are getting really courageous to say, okay, so you have this tool and we're going to replace it with an entirely different one that does basically the same thing, that's where resistance really starts. And if you want to do this, you have to involve all of the key actors. You need to really communicate and talk and explain and motivate. Um, I have this slide here that shows you some of the good examples. They're in green. And then the bad examples, they're in red. Um, and I basically wanted to talk about one that is not on this map yet because I hadn't had found the time to update it. And that's about uh, a city district of Istanbul, Eyüp Sultan, which in 2015, so it's already five years ago, they did a two-year program to switch the entire city district over to open source desktops. It's one of those cases where they say, here you have, you're used to working with a certain environment, we're going to replace it by something entirely different that does exactly the same. One of the reasons that it succeeded is that the IT administrators made sure that the desktop looked very, very similar. Um, and so for the people that were introduced to these new desktops, uh, they were like, okay, so what actually did change? Okay, so the colors looked a little bit different, but, but all the other things were right in place. And it made it a lot easier. You can, uh, if you have the slides, you can mouse over these um, points and click on them and you'll find the URL right above to the article that says, this is not how to do it, or like here, this is how to do it when you want to make uh, changes. And there are, there are tons of um, anecdotes on Ozor about these things, because we pay a lot of attention to that. But the fourth big step, you can click out of this, is that you have to engage communities. First of all, in order to do that, you have to, as a public service, probably fix the way you procure your ICT. You want to make sure that your procurement office understands that, they, that you want open source and that they are legally allowed to ask for it. You can, you can directly say, I want a Linux something something, because you do not break competition by asking for Linux, because anybody can offer you a Linux something something. However, if you say, I want a proprietary operating system, it's only the proprietary vendor that can offer it. So there you are breaking procurement law. You can make open source part of the award criteria. I already mentioned that. And on Ozor, you will find sample text that you can just plop into your procurement uh, request and it will start to slowly prefer open source as the uh, outcome of your procurement. You want to do a little bit like Helsinki did. Uh, Helsinki had a took a, a few years to to mull and consider how they would go to open source. They weren't entirely sure they wanted it a lot. Uh, thanks to push from the city council, um, they have now a, a Helsinki loves open source program where they are act actively hiring people from the communities to work in the city and work directly uh, on open source tools used in the city and contribute back to the community that these people come from. You want to optimize your procurement processes to be able to work with SMEs and specialists. This is really tricky for especially the larger public uh, services. They find it really hard to get there, um, but it's really important because this is where most of the open source actually happens. If you want examples for this, you want to read how Sweden is trying to tackle it. They've done two very large framework contracts. Those are the overall steps that governments can take to get into software, um, to start using certain software. And Sweden has prepared this whole process so they can say, I want a content management system. I can call these small firms, these five, and they will tell me this is the tool we will offer and this is the services that we will offer around it. And it, it, it takes care of all the headaches that the public service would normally have with finding an SME and with getting open source introduced into their organization. You have to promote, sponsor and facilitate open source development. There's various ways to do this, just anecdotes. Amsterdam has a, uh, has a, has a, has a data unit that does a lot on open data and most of that software is, that they use is open source. And what they do is once a month or once a quarter, they open their office to 
basically visitors. And it's mostly young entrepreneurs, uh, new companies in the city that come and sit there and say, hey, we've been looking at your data for the garbage trucks. And we're trying to work it into an app that does something. And here's a bunch of tools that we use. What are you using? And they together uh, work on um, in a sort of a hackathon kind of way on new, uh, on new apps. It's a nice way for Amsterdam to get in touch with entrepreneurs, and it's a very cool way for Amsterdam to get up to speed on what is new and what is exciting in the software world. And most of that is open source. You can do like the city of Munich. I think they no longer do this, but they used to. They would organize once a year a cook fest. The IT department, the open source guys, they would cook, and all the other people would come and help them fix their bugs. And literally people from all over the world would fly in to uh, help the city uh, do these things. Um, it's very well recommended for public services to join open source communities by starting to engage with the boards of, for example, let's think the Document Foundation or any of the other open source uh, groups that take care of, uh, say, PostgreSQL or MySQL, no, maybe not MySQL, but so that they, they get on board and they start discussing with the community the, the, the roadmap of the software. Here's a bunch of examples. Um, Open Europa, um, one of the big projects at the Commission, uh, all focusing on Drupal development. The Commission sometimes says it, it looks like it's almost the biggest employer of Drupal developers in Europe. In Nantes, um, where they, um, they did a special tender for services to improve LibreOffice. They saved a lot of money by switching to LibreOffice and part of that money was reserved to be paid back to the community in the form of this procurement. The GDS in the UK, they give their, sta their staff time off to work on open office, to, sorry, to work on open source, sorry about that. Uh, Munich, uh, in the, it, when it was still a superpower on open source was one of the biggest contributors to many open source projects. In France, there is the uh, Government Modernization Unit, DINSEC is the old name. They, they do a lot of hackathons and sprints in which they invite citizens, in which they engage citizens and companies to, uh, to work on government projects. Famous example in Europe is Developers Italia from Team Digitale, the, the Government Modernization Unit in Italy. Um, for example, in their Summer of Codes, they did hackathons all over the country. They engage with SMEs. They, they work in so many ways in Italy to try and improve the uh, input for open source. I already mentioned Helsinki. I already mentioned Amsterdam. Uh, the other two interesting ones. Sweden, I mentioned their uh, interesting uh, framework approach. Barcelona is neat because it works with citizens and NGOs to try and improve the city. And a lot of that is organized around open source. So those were the four steps. Um, and then you come to the, to the key policies. The, um, there's, there's nothing much to see on this slide, but there are, there's a lot of things that I can talk about it. And here's, I'll, I'll reveal you a little trick for those who are following this slide from my site itself. If you now click on uh, Shift S, the capital S, you will see all the notes and you will see all the links that I'm talking about well, as I rattle off my little talk. So one of the most interesting things to watch out for is that the European Commission is doing a huge study um, on the economic impact of open source and open, so open source hardware, open source software on the um, competitiveness and innovation in Europe and the I don't know when this study will be done, um, but there will probably be a workshop organized in Brussels in early November, if, if we're allowed to do workshops in those days, where uh, uh, people will talk about intermediate results of that study. You also want to keep an eye out on the joiner platform and look for the EU FOSA project. Um, it's the Commission's open source security and auditing uh, project, and it's it's done and it's now slowly pushing its deliverables, its reports and studies, its uh, surveys and inventories out onto uh, JoinUp. Interesting policies to read and look at. Um, I think the Tallinn Declaration from 2017 is a very good starting point uh, because it mentions open source at several, several spots. 
Um, it demands open source solutions. It wants open standards. It says governments should avoid IT vendor lock-in. It says that governments should share their solutions publicly um, to encourage reuse. Another one is uh, in France, there is a, a droit numérique, the digital law, uh, which has rules on public sector information, really promotes an open source culture in the country. And it is uh, making a lot of uh, uh, positive effects. And in the UK, you have the open standards policy and the open source policy. The links are in the notes, you can find them. Um, two more examples that are interesting is Bulgaria, excuse me, uh, in Bulgaria, public services are now by law required to, for new IT software projects, immediately make the source code available as open source. Another interesting approach, uh, which is no longer, I think, put in practice, but it's interesting to consider, is that in Sweden, the procurement specialists have figured out a way to make the companies that do the software development responsible for sharing the open source code with the upstream developers and not the public administrations. Because usually these small towns have no idea what it means to share code on GitHub or GitLab, but the companies will. A lot of countries in Europe have set targets, but it's a bit hazy for us to follow where they are with these, but Slovakia, Poland and Hungary um, have all set that they would publish 20% or 12% or 40% of their code as open source. Um, I already mentioned the Basque country. Um, we've skipped over the, uh, we've skimmed the United Kingdom's open standards policy. Okay, it's all there. So, okay, I think I've covered that all. The expected benefits, um, I'll summarize it. It's about technological sovereignty. It's about efficiency and economic growth. So then we get to the point of the things that are missing. The big thing we still need to continue to do is raising awareness on the benefits of open source. Across Europe, um, I recommend we try and figure out a way to improve the advocacy of open source. Uh, and of course, procurement has to be fixed. But for raising awareness, that's something the people who are in this talk uh, and listening to me, that, that's something you can get involved in. Um, some of, some of this is now starting to actually fall into place. Um, earlier this year in Brussels, uh, all of the European open source software service providers, the companies, the SMEs, started to become one European organization called Appel. Um, it's going to be joined by Finland, France and Germany, but it would be really cool if Portugal and Spain joined them soon. Uh, and have a European voice as SMEs pushing this innovative industry. I'm over my time, so I will summarize the tasks, uh, summarize the, uh, the how to uh, push open source and public services. You make it a task for the CEO. You have to ensure that there is political support. You need to figure out a way to make uh, open standards practical in the organization. You need to help the organization change and you have to find a way as a public service how to you need to learn how to engage with uh, with the communities and with that uh, we've come to the end of my slides i will go back to the desktop here and stop sharing the screen uh, thank you for the presentation yes, thank, you. thank you very much yes yes thank you very much it was really interesting for the people attending, know that you can ask him questions, you can write it in the Q&I, or you can, and then you can come to stage with us and participate here and as direct, as a speaker. And I will have to put my glasses on <laughs> to actually read the questions. Sorry about that, so now you see what I look like with that. I will read it for you, don't worry for that. Yeah. But it was really interesting what you say about appeal if one country want to participate, for example, if Spain want to do it, what do yes. they need to do? What can they do it? Well, so Appel, um, I'm not, I'm not with that organization. I was just there when uh -huh. they announced it. Um, Appel tries to uh, unify the, the the industry associations per member state. So, 
In Germany, for example, you have the Open Source Business Alliance. In France, it's the CNNL. Um, and in, in Infinite, it's yet another organization. And they all represent, in France, I think it's like 300 organizations, uh, Germany 250, and then the one in Finland, another 50 or so. But they represent SMEs, uh, f f single experts, but also small, uh, small groups of like 30 or, f or 40 or 150 people. Um, and these trade organizations can uh, join Appel. And that's, it's, it's more than a letterhead, but it, because it starts to show the commission and others that these SMEs are actually quite, they're quite interesting as an, as an energetic um, section of society that is doing cool things with software and, and all of this is open source. And they start to see, uh, the Basque country is always a clear example. They start to see mm -hmm. it's working. It's, it's, it's starting on it, it's standing on its own two feet. You see it, I think, in many Spanish uh, cities where the public sector says we'll work with the local, uh, the local groups, uh, local companies. Uh, and so there is a growing industry in Spain. There is definitely a growing industry in France. And it's starting to become very visible in oh, Germany. Interesting. So getting them to represent at the European level is very oh, important. That's good to know. We have one question here. The question is how people can raise awareness with public administration, local IT departments or public, political parties? Yeah, so um, <laughs> one way to do this is to actually start becoming active in your, in your own uh, council. The, the number of people that that I've met over the past years that understand open source really in all of the, the different granularities and levels that are in politics is very low. It's like 10 or 20 and, and that's across Europe and that's not enough. Um, that's why when you look, for example, at the track and trace um, developments the past few months, that's why the governments all said, okay, we'll hire somebody and they will do something because that's, that's their mindset. And if we had people in, in IT, uh, people with experience in IT who would be in those positions, they would say, yeah, no, that's not how we do things. We would, we would open this process. We would organize people to do this in a hackathon kind of way. Um, we would make sure that the standards are based, that the standards are open. We are, we make sure that the, that the protocol is not centralized, but decentralized or federalized. It changes the, it changes the questions they ask. So we need more people who are listening to my speech to actually become politicians. <laughs> That's one way. The other way is to politely inform your council members that there are alternatives and that there are really big cities and big countries and big public administrations who are doing this. And you can, you can use the Ozor as inspiration. You have uh, the Gendarmerie, which is 72,000 desktops across the world. The most of them, of course, are in France, but they have desktops all over Oceania. The, you have the French, the Italian army, that's 110 desktops. And this is, this is when you look at desktops. Um, and when you look at, at, anyway, there's hundreds of examples. And, and this should encourage public services to say, we should do the same. And you see this in Spain too. Um, the, Consul and this and this the CDEM are being reused all over the place. They're they're like really huge examples of mm -hmm. reuse. So I think that's yes. starting to work. Okay, we have another question here. Okay, we have another the case of Barcelona that began with post several years before. What is the balance and how to propagate this model into other cities? Okay, so there I didn't completely understand yeah, the question. The case of Can Barcelona repeat? that began was several years before. What is the balance and how to propagate this model to other cities? Barcelona is not the only city who is taking this step. Um, I, I put Barcelona in my slides because I find it interesting that they work um, that they have a focus that is on how to make sure that our citizens and our NGOs and our 
uh, SMEs are involved in the things we do as a city to improve also life in the city, which is different than uh, from other examples where they do not have that specific focus, um, where they will be focused on where the aim is just to improve the public services. And then they start doing IT things and then they 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 consider open source as part of that. But it's that has in Barcelona is interesting because it really has a focus on getting the citizens involved. You don't see that that much in other cities. Uh, but you will see that, of course, in a city like Paris, which is also focusing a lot on making sure the citizens are in there and their tools, uh, Lutetch, for example, is all built around um, making sure that the citizens can participate in discussions on the budget or that they can, they can report uh, immediately uh, issues that they see in the city, things that are broken or things that should be fixed. It can all be reported online through an open source tool. And of course, the citizens don't realize it's open oh, source. Interesting. Okay, someone else have a question? or someone? I, I think Barcelona made a lot of waves a while ago uh, on the Francesca, uh, when, when Fr Francesca Bria was the CEO there. They, they, they got a lot of press attention, media attention. Um, so that will have helped make other cities aware that open source is a good tool to reach some of these more citizen-focused ideas. Very good. Really interesting. Okay, if someone wants to raise their hand and come to stage with us, or ask a question in the Q&A, we, we still have a few minutes. Sorry, okay, I No, I there is not a question. Questions. I ask you if someone has a question. We just have one now. Yeah, I don't know what happened with the sound now. I can hear myself. Okay, we have one question. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. It's just that it wasn't. Yeah, what very happened well. with the countries like Greece yeah, that don't have to spend the also agenda? Ah, but Greece is an interesting country. Not only is it very pretty, um, but it's one of those countries that you don't often hear about. But when you start looking, you'll find an enormous amount of open source all over the place. Of course, the um, for for me, there is I have a there's a language barrier because I don't read Greek, um, so I I use translation tools all the time to figure out and um, what's going on. But one of the cool examples is a classroom tool called Epoptes, which was developed by a bunch of school teachers who wanted to use open source for their labs, the, the school labs, and they wanted to be able to. It's a little bit like Big Blue Button. They wanted to be able to manage these desktops from these kids from one place and make it really easy. And this tool is being used in, in multiple places, not only all over, all over the Greek islands, but it's used in other countries as well. Um, there is Heraklion, which is using open source almost for the entire stack. There is uh, Athens and my colleagues are not going to forgive me. There's another very big city in Greece that is also using a lot of open source. Um, it's just that you don't always hear about it. But there is a study that we did um, in the context of that EU FOSA project. It's, you should go to the OSR site and find the OSR, find the FOSA projects. There's a study um, that summarizes some of these events and it includes a chapter on Greece. So Interesting. Yes, you can find open source in literally every EU member state. You just need to, you know, persevere <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. So we don't have any questions. I find Denmark is always a, is also a cool example because they have um, uh, an organization called OS2, which represents 90% of all the municipalities and they work on an open source stack. And it is such a, it's such a, it makes so much sense, right? So they have one town that says, we have uh, something, something for the library. And the other one says, okay, so then we'll use yours. And we have a bit of budget, so you'll get our budget, so you can improve your tool and we can reuse it. This is, this is where it started. And now they have tools for everything that, uh, that cities and, and towns and villages would need in Denmark. And it's all based on open source tools and it's internationalized. It's coded in, in modern languages. It's, it can be, if it was useful immediately for um, for other countries, they, they can just go to OS2 and start okay. using it. 
often, of course, the the reuse case stops at the border, but there are cases where it actually crosses the border. So, uh, Litech, the Paris uh, solution, is one example. There's a few in Denmark that are being reused in Greenland, and so on. Oh, that's so great. There is there is a lot of geographic information software built, for example, in Finland, and that's used in Canada, the US, by Russia, all over the Commission, stuff like that. So, yeah, great. So thank you very much, Mark, for your presentation and your time. Are you going to appear now in the networking chat? Are you going to continue here in the networking? Um, I'll be oh, around great. for so a then bit, yeah. The people can talk to you because now is the time to networking, so we can see some oh, with this one question. Maybe we can answer what? Okay, well, I will put my, my glasses back and on and see what happens. So he's we'll using that, uh, adopting for an estate, right? Yeah. Yes, okay, the one about the maps. Yeah, that's an interesting one. My slides did have that map in there. Um, but And I've, I've there was somebody in Germany who approached me on it, but we never got around to finishing it. But it would be really nice to have somebody to go over the items and say, okay, so city council... I'll put it on the map and link it back. That, yeah, okay, we need great. To do that. So what, now we finish the presentation. Anyway. Thank you very much. We are working. Remember that if you go to the tables and you put the micro on and the camera, you can talk with other people in the table and share knowledge. And Heist will be there. So thank you very much. All right. Very much. Thank you for having me. See you later. All right. Bye bye.